uh, LTE solutions. Taimur, you can start. Thank you so much, Agnieszka. Um, I, uh, this is Taimur. I am a technical sales manager at Redline Communications. And um, thank you so much uh, to Wincom and all of, for arranging this and for all of you to join in us today, um, specifically talking about uh, private LTE and Redline's offerings. So uh, today um, I will be discussing about, uh, you know, start with a little brief introduction of Redline Communications, then talk about private LTE, specifically in industrial space, because that is where we see most of the trend for private LTE is, uh, is going. And um, uh, I will talk about what is the need of a private LTE in, in that space, uh, what are the differences uh, that we've seen with our experience um, in private LTE and a public or a consumer grade, we call it LTE networks that MNOs and ISPs provide. And then, um, uh, then we will briefly talk about what are red lines, uh, LTE networks offerings and how it plays a major role in private LTE network and, uh, and meets all those requirements. So, uh, Starting off with a quick introduction. If you guys were there in our first webinar, then Julian did a great job introducing. Um, Redline is a, a publicly traded uh, Canadian company and primarily focused on broadband communication systems. And uh, we work in, an industri in a niche industrial market. So all the products that we develop uh, are uh, with the focus on industrial installations and inst industrial uh, requirements. Uh, we have uh, around 70 uh, projects running in around 70 countries. And our major focus when it comes to uh, private industrial LTE is uh, uh, mining companies, oil and gas, military organizations, public safety, and energy utility uh, 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 organizations where, and we see that these organizations have a big push towards uh, developing private LTE networks to meet their needs. And what are those needs? We will talk about it. So you can actually see that uh, Redline has a huge footprint globally when it comes to uh, energy deployments. Uh, so we, what we, the products that we've developed, that's been, uh, you know, working hand in hand with our industrial uh, clients and our industrial partners. And uh, whether that is, uh, we have two technologies, one's virtual fiber, which is more like a point to point, point to multi-point industrial grade last mile solution and industrial LTE uh end-to-end uh, -end solution so that's been built keeping our experience in this uh in this field so without wasting much of your time uh i want to move towards the private industrial lte networks and why i'm focusing more whenever i say private my more inclination is towards industrial applications because that's where we see the major drive uh, a lot of organizations, they are trying to um, achieve or trying to go towards Industry 4.0. And Industry 4.0 is um, the, the first time we heard this name was, or this term was from German engineers. And uh, uh, when they were referring to uh, integration of their existing industrial systems uh, with the modern information and technologies and modern uh, methods. So, uh, what are those methods? Like if our goal is to um, get to industry 4.0, then the, the two major technologies that, we, that comes to our mind is artificial intelligence and machine learning, machine to machine communication. And this artificial intelligence and machine to machine communication and learning cannot be completed without big data. So in order to enable, in order to, uh, get artificial intelligence. We need to have big data, and for big data, uh, uh, industrial organizations they they are installing hundreds of thousands of sensors in their fields with each and every equipment, each and every moving part to have better understanding of uh, of the processes, get real time data, and uh, to 
take uh, quick and real time steps and actions based on those data and also to see the trend so they can uh, do their maintenance more proactively. So this all cannot be achieved until or unless those sensors are connected to the servers or the machines are connected to machines. And that's where the communication uh, comes in. And I will not be wrong to say that uh, communication in this, uh, in this strive to get to industry 4.0 is the backbone of the whole system. So when we're talking about the industrial communication, uh, uh, we are not only, mostly when we talk about communication, it comes to information and technology. I've been asked so many times, you are an IT guy. Yes, partially, yes, I'm an IT guy. But uh, when we talk about information technologies, the first thing or the example that comes to my mind is uh, the, the, the public LTE networks or 5G networks that we're seeing uh, in our cities which are mainly used for user-to-user -user communication, cloud computing, and uh, <clears throat> a transfer of data in one form and, or another in a, in a regulated, in a controlled environment. But uh, when we're talking about industrial communication, then the term operational technologies uh, comes into play. And as a matter of fact, in industrial uh, deployment or industrial networks, the operation technologies, they take preference, preferences over uh, information technology. So <clears throat> what are the operational technologies? So we're talking about connecting different sensors. We are talking about enabling the artificial intelligence. And these technologies are, or these requirements are a lot different than IT for many reasons. Let me start with the, with the simple SCADA devices. So if we have SCADA devices connected to, let's take an example of an oil and gas company connected to uh, multiple uh, wellheads and, and dozens of sensors connected to those wellheads, then most of the traffic that's going from, this, uh, from the wellheads towards the servers is actually uplink oriented. <clears throat> The consumer grade technology that we are used to of seeing are mostly downlink centric uh, technologies. So here is one difference. It's rather than being downlink oriented, now we have to be either look at more uplink oriented or bi-directional uh, uh, configurations. Number two, taking the same example, uh, a smartphone in my hand is not gonna work if we put it at the wellhead. At the wellhead. The reason wellhead is uh, uh, there's uh, wherever there's oil, there uh, you know oil fields have high amount of H2S gas, and we all know H2S is um, extra deadly poisonous gas. It's uh, highly combustible and extremely corrosive gas. So a smartphone won't work there. Like uh, you know the consumer grade product's not going to work there. So the product that needs to be installed there is 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 supposed to be built and designed to meet to stay and work in that harsh environment. Going forward, these are just simple examples of UEs, but reliability is a very major aspect of an industrial operational technologies uh, requirement. So reliability of the network, I'm not gonna talk much more about it, but uh, just uh, consider that this communication system is going to connect not only people who can be okay with a, a latency or a downtime of a minute or 30 seconds or so, but there are machines which are supposed to work uh, in uh, harmony with other machines and latency or breakage actually results into huge losses, monetary losses, and sometimes can cause a hazard for that particular asset. So that's one. Again, uh, giving you another example is autonomous vehicles. We've seen a lot, uh, the mining specifically moving towards a lot of autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, I've been told once uh, during the trial that these huge mining trucks when they have to apply this emergency brakes, those emergency brakes are number one, extremely costly. And number two, once those emergency brakes are applied, then 
it cannot be that emergency braking system cannot be used again it has to be completely changed and then not talking about only you know I, i'm just talking about the expenses to change that braking system but we also need to talk about the monetary losses when uh, due to the downtime or uh, inability, inability for that uh, mining truck to work so saying that operation technologies are the preference when it comes to industrial network uh, uh, security of these networks are extremely important that I will be talking about in our uh, next slide. So uh, understanding the differences is going to help us. It is going to help our partners. It is going to help the IT team and decision makers in industrial space to pick the right, uh, make the right choice when adopting, uh, uh, ad ad adopting the solution. So uh, I've just highlighted a few. If you guys have any questions or concerns or want to ask more about it, please feel free to ask me questions. And uh, I, if, if possible, I will answer you right away or uh, uh, you know, at the end of this, like, uh, of, this, uh, of this presentation. So <clears throat> going a bit deeper into the differences between private LTE and public consumer grade LTE networks is uh, the security of the network. We've seen in 2013, one of the major oil and gas company got hacked and their operations were stopped. Seeing that all the oil and gas uh, organizations across the world, they started invest, uh, uh, investing a lot in the security of their network. So a lot of these organizations, whether they're mining or they are uh, uh, oil and gas companies or utility companies, uh, they tend to, not not only get the private LTE because the MNOs in that area are not providing the coverage, but also because security is their major concern. They don't want to do the RAN share. They don't want to get into a position where their, their network security can be jeopardized. So they want to have a completely isolated private LTE, which has been used for their own specific requirements. And they don't want to share that data or share the network. So that's one. Number two, complete control over the QoS. Um, consumer grade LTE networks have uh, been 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 deployed in a way that, as I've mentioned, like let's say downlink centric. So most 80, 90 percent of their uh, their uh, customers are looking for downloading videos, downloading data, or at max have video, video conferencing, and that's it. So they are mostly heavily uh, downlink centric. Their QoS are totally different, but in an industrial space, when operation technology is involved, when latency is of crucial importance, when reliability is of very importance, then the organizations, they want to have a complete control over their quality of service. They want to be able to make decisions and control which service takes precedence over which other service. For instance, in, a, in an environment, in an, uh, let's say in a mining environment, uh, autonomous vehicles, they have to have to get the most, uh, uh, you know, highest priority. And then maybe they can go away with, they can live with, a bit of a delay in email exchanges or a little bit of breakage in the in the voice communication but the autonomous vehicles have to be of uh, get the higher priority so they want to be in control of that uh, another thing is we got to also understand the the, the basics the fundamentals of these two networks uh, let's take an example of vodafone the network is actually the source of revenue it is it's a revenue driven network so the bigger the network is the more the capacity they have the more revenue they will generate so they are investing in it because this is their commodity but in an in private lte uh, or a private network the communication network or lte industrial lte network is uh, not the revenue driving commodity it is actually an enabler it is an enabler to help optimize the, uh, the, the, the processes, reduce the op overall cooperation costs and uh, increase the production of that uh, organization. So it's not a revenue driven uh, solution. So unlike uh, uh, Vodafone, we, Vodafone, which will uh, invest a lot in a lot of money on building new towers, setting up uh, 
you know, new shelters, power arrangements, and get a very uh, uh, big network, industrial networks, they want to minimize their overall cost of deploying this network, and they want to keep it minimum, and they want to keep their operational cost minimum too, because again, it is the enabler. So there's a fundamental difference in these two, uh, two networks. One more thing about uh, you know the the scale and size and revenue generation. Uh, a, a good example or a clear picture of this can be drawn like um, any MNO that you pick. If they're if you go to their headquarters, it's going to be multi-story headquarters, and ninety percent of the store uh, floors are be, will be uh, given to the IT professionals, the guys who are monitoring the network, the guys, the teams who are optimizing the network continuously, drive testing teams. There will be operation maintenance teams for those uh, networks. But in an in an industrial environment, the IT teams are comparatively smaller, and they are actually doing multiple tasks, taking care of the visa taking care of their last mile uh, communication, uh, push to talk technologies. So they are doing it all in a, while, while staying in a smaller, uh, smaller team. So now for an industrial application or industrial user to bring in special LTE specialized team to run that network, it's, it's, it's kind of an overdue. So, <clears throat> so the network has to be like... Uh, you know, easy and simple to operate. So the IT professionals, they can easily maintain it, run it, and has a low operational cost. So uh, they, they cannot have uh, hundreds of people doing drive testing every day for this network. So the, 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 the differences are, I, I hope that they are clear here. And secondly, uh, again, I'm going to mention the major difference between IT and OT is there and needs to be kept in mind. So moving forward, when we've understood the differences between a private network and, uh, and, and, and a public consumer grade network, what are the things, what are the main ingredients of a, which make a good industrial network? So we've actually broke, broken, it, broken it down into uh, six points. Number one, that it has to be extremely rugged and reliable product. Most of the industrial or private networks that we're talking about are the areas where consumer grade MNOs, ISPs are not providing coverage because they are in the middle of nowhere. So these areas can be, we've seen, uh, could be in Alaska, like extremely cold weather, Middle East, where I am actually based in, um, very hot. Believe you me, it's extremely hot here in uh, Oman right now. Um, and uh, so temperature goes up to 50, 55 degrees. So uh, so has to be extremely rugged, has to be reliable. It has to have intrinsic safety built in into it. So uh, exactly the way I've talked about the wellhead and H2S presence near the well, uh, well, uh, wellheads or drilling rigs. So it has to be uh, protective. Uh, it has to be uh, to meet the certain standards to work in those spe special uh, areas. Number two, it has to be deployable. When I'm talking about deployable, I'm talking about quick and easy deployment. I've mentioned that uh, private LTE, the industrial uh, organization, industrial space, they do not have huge IT teams, one taking care of installation, and the other drive testing optimization, and then uh, monitoring the network. So they have small teams that the product should be way easy to deploy. It should be way easy to, very easy to uh, maintain and operate. It should be, so, uh, so we've seen in LTE networks, I'm talking from experience, a lot of LTE networks, they need, uh, 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 you know, specialized engineers in, uh, uh, specialized engineers in codings and uh, <clears throat> in Linux-based systems. So most of their operations, most of the configuration of a consumer-grade LTE network is based on Linux. And uh, so, so the network should not be that complicated. It should be scalable. Uh, in terms of, um, let me give you an example. Again, I'm comparing, uh, I'm trying to make a point that private LTE and consumer grade LTE technologies are totally different. 
It's not an apple to apple comparison. One is apple, the other is orange. So let's say that a uh, in a consumer grade MNOs network is, is built, their core is built, their EUtron network is built to, uh, to provide services to hundreds of, to, to millions of people across the country, across the, across the cities. Uh, but in an, in an industrial space, we're not talking about millions of people. We are not talking about uh, a very huge covering the whole city, but we're talking about a controlled environment where hundreds of thousands of sensors are going to be there. Thousands of, uh, uh, thousands of uh, employees are going to be there, but it's not in any way comparable to a consumer grade LTE network. So now adopting a technology, adopting a solution which has been built for to take care of millions of millions of people um, can actually end up in buying a core network of LTE, EPC, Evolved Packet Core, uh, which needs uh, a complete huge data center to be built, which needs uh, dozens of racks, a lot of air conditioning, uh, thousands of cables uh, uh, going in between them. So it is, it is, yes, it's scalable, but it's scalable on a large scale. But over industrial requirements, we're talking about downgrading, the downscaling the network. We're talking about thousands of uh, UEs. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of UEs. So the idea or, or to build such a big data center for this uh, requirement is kind of an overkill and it's going to be extremely costly. So the network or the solution should be scalable to meet the size, whether somebody wants to have 25 UEs or they want to have 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. So it should be scalable and you should, and the, and the end customer should only pay for the system that they need, the parameters, the, the size of the network that they need rather than investing in a huge uh, uh, evolved packet code. So this is the idea uh, that should be scalable uh, downwards and upwards. So today, if they're talking about 10,000 UEs and tomorrow they're going to talk about 100,000, so the network or the product should have this capability to be upscalable or downscalable. So the burden or initial capex of initial capex is not that much to reduce that. Uh, the network should be extremely flexible in terms of backhauling. It should add more reliability into it. Uh, we've seen mostly 95 or 98% of our clients who talk in, in the industrial space, they always ask about redundancy. They always ask about what if there is a failure? What if this E node B stops working? What if the connection with the EPC and the E node B stops working? So the solution should have redundancy mechanisms in place. And uh, well, uh, so I think I've, I've I've covered it all, that what are the needs, what do they need, and what should be incorporated into a solution to be considered for the private industrial use. So as, does anybody have any questions so far? You can send a question, question and answers section. I think I see there's no question. So uh, what I'm gonna go do is now talking about the differences in private LTE network. Uh, there's a question. Yes, sure, please. Uh, uh, can you please type in your question? Yes, you have offshore site. Uh, Ahmed, I get your, uh, I think that you want to know what do we offer for offshore site. And I think that you are in luck. The, uh, in my next slides, when I'll be talking about our uh, LTE solution, uh, the example that I've picked is actually an offshore environment. So uh, if you hang in there, uh, I will be talking about it. is das working there cool 
So yeah, sure, uh, Ahmed, I will, I will come to that in, uh, in a minute. So, uh, oh, there are more questions. Uh, this is, okay. So, uh, talking about the differences in the, in the environments that industrial applications in the LTE networks are deployed, their, their applications that they will be running, and all of those differences, redline communications, understanding those differences has come up with our industrial LTE uh, system, which is a complete suit. Uh, just to give an idea, LTE network for, to the people who've been working with last mile point to point, point to multi point kind of technologies, uh, which were mostly layer two technologies, LTE network is a layer three network. And in order for LTE network to work, it needs three major components. And number one is the Evolve Packet Core, which is the, the core network of LTE, network, uh, of LTE solution. And then EU TRAN, which is the RAN, the wireless communication system, and mostly uh, uh, we call it E node B. Uh, e node B is exactly what in uh, previous, in Wi-Fi terminologies we used to call access point. In, um, in WiMAX, we call a base station. So in LTE, we call it E node B. And then we have UEs, the handheld devices or remote terminals that, that communicate with the E node B uh, and get the, uh, get the signals. And then we have SIMs. So we have a complete suite of LTE, industrial LTE uh, uh, technology, which has EPC, E node B, uh, SIM cards and through our uh, uh, ecosystem partners, we also provide industrial grade UEs. Uh, so it is very important and I will be, I will keep on repeating this, that all of the, these different components in our LTE offerings are 3GPP standard based. Why I will keep on uh, repeating it is because if you want to call a system LTE, it needs to be 3GPP standard based. It needs to be interoperable because LTE is going to allow you, enable you to following the standard, you will not be only a vendor locked kind of a system environment. You will have open market in front of you. You set e EPC from one vendor, you get E node B from another, and you get UEs for another, from another. So whatever suits you, you can always build your own specific network. So having 3GPP solution gives you a lot of flexibility and it ensures that the network that you have is actually following some uh, standards rather than being a proprietary solution. You uh, today it's easy to install that network. Tomorrow you get to know you cannot interoperate it with anybody else. Number two, when I will be talking about our LT industrial LTE solution, I will be I will keep on putting a lot of focus that this is industrial LTE network. So mobility is supposed to be part of it. You take mobility out of an LTE network, you're making it actually, you know, um, uh, uh, you, you're taking the, the whole reason of uh, deploying an LTE network. Because if you see that uh, moving from the point to, uh, point to point, fixed point to point, fixed point to multi-point solutions towards LTE is one of the reason is to enable not only your OT, but have a unified network that can communicate and gives you uh, and gives you a platform to connect your sensors. Uh, it gives you platform to connect the people and users, your task force in the field, uh, and, and and collaborate and, and and encompass all of these needs. So if you take out the mobility out of it, I don't think uh, there is any point of talking about that. So we have complete mobile, mobile LTE and it is uh, 3GPP standard based <clears throat> and a complete solution. There is one more question. Uh, that's uh, sales. Um, Zviad, I'm sorry. I hope that I am, I am, I'm pronouncing your name properly. Uh, I can, you can obviously always reach out to Ag Agnieszka or me 
and I will connect you to the right person uh, for uh, uh, Republic of Georgia. There are, okay, there are more questions as a matter of fact. I'm sorry, I'm taking a break and to answer this question. We, can we have PTT UEs on LT network? Yes, definitely you can have PTT uh, UEs. As a matter of fact, um, Amar, we Redline have we have our own suite of push to talk application, which uh, I'm not actually covering today, but it actually allows you to uh, have a complete uh, industrial grade push to talk platform and uh, complete uh, and enables you not to use PTT between smartphones, but also integrates with legacy with. Uh, 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 two-way communication systems like P25, like um, Tetra, LMR, DMR systems. So you can actually, using our PTT solution, bring them. Uh, band N77, David, I can share all the bands that we have uh, for you, uh, uh, the list of bands, so it will be clear. If uh, we are also open to uh, adding more bands into our solution, uh, but we need to see what is the opportunity. So, and it's not that time consuming for the way we built our LTE solution. Um, Amar, is LTE available on license free frequency? So uh, Amar, the, your other question for license free frequency is I can talk about that CBRS band, uh, which in North America is not completely um, license exempted, I'm sure, I think, but it, uh, it is for the private use and uh, private organizations can use it. But if you're talking, your question is about 5.4 to 5.8 gigahertz, which is ISM band. So for that, you have to wait because uh, we don't have LTE in that band, but it's definitely in our roadmap to build a private, uh, uh, sorry, unlicensed band uh, LTE network. Actually, uh, yeah. So I hope that answers this question. <clears throat> so uh, this is where I was talking to, oh my, another question. Okay, this one's in there. So this is what I was talking to Ahmed about, uh, <clears throat> about the, that I've actually put up our, rather than going through the data sheets of our solution and opening up e B and reading out the, the specifications, the capacity, the, the channel size, the frequency bands. I thought I will, I will talk about uh, certain uh, uh, differentiation factors, uh, certain factors that allow us to deploy these, uh, make us industrial grade LTE. Um, because uh, if, if, the, if the point is to read only the parameters, then we can do it through by reading data sheets. And it's pretty boring. I, and I, I hope that uh, um, I made this decision for you guys, but um, I hope that you all agree with it. So um, uh, before I go forward, I think I'll take another question. Oh, all right. So, <clears throat> so I've set up a, a complete offshore uh, environment um, LTE deployment. And uh, I want to talk one by one about different elements. So as I've mentioned for an LTE network, it is not about just setting up the radio and getting your network up and running. For LTE deployment, we need to have uh, um, core network deployed first. Core network um, in uh, LTE is ev evolved packet core, EPC. So we have our 3GPP standard-based EPC, which, encompasses which actually has all the elements that are supposed to be in an LTE EPC, which includes um, HSS, authentication, P gateways, S gateways, MMEs. So just to go into a bit detail of that, <clears throat> I hope it works. Uh, much, yeah. So it works. So, so our packet core, as I've been talking about, should be, so it's a 3GPP standard based, includes all those uh, standardized core elements, MME, S gateway, P gateway, PCRF, HSS, all in one suit. It's a virtual 
uh, machine-based, uh, VM-based uh, EPC system. And the beauty of this EPC system is the scalability of it. So if you are talking about 50 or 100 UEs today, uh, then you can have an EPC uh, completely configured and uh, good to go in a small nook, pocket-sized server. But if you were talking about expanding and, and want to uh, improve, increase the scope of your LTE network and get into uh, thousands of uh, tens of thousands of UEs or then hundreds of thousands of UEs, then we can always scale it up or scale it down. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what is your usage, where, uh, what are the requirements. In certain cases, uh, it's not that easy to get uh, uh, air conditioned environment or big huge uh, data centers to put your EPC. So we can also support distributed EPCs, redundant EPCs, so they can act as redundant to each other. If one goes down, the other one uh, can take over and vice versa. It's extremely important when we're talking about an industrial uh, ap uh, applications and usage. I can give you a very clear uh, example of, I won't name the customer, but our uh, one of our oil and gas customer, they wanted to have a complete end-to-end -end redundancy where uh, they were operating our virtual fiber uh, technology and they wanted to have two radios, two remote terminals on one each wellhead and two sector controllers operating on the tower end. And they wanted to have complete frequency diversity, space diversity, uh, uh, hardware diversity. They want to have a complete end-to-end, -end, uh, a robust kind of a redundancy to make it failure proof. So in these kind of uh, environment, redundancy reliability is extremely important. So we, our EPC, enables and has all the redundancy features and it actually supports a distributed core uh, technology what happens in a distributed core system is that uh, <clears throat> you can actually take the mme uh, hss and s uh, and uh, s gateway away from the core and deploy it right next to the e node b so now it's not centralized epc but it is distributed EPC, which adds more flexibility to your backhaul planning, and it adds more flexibility to, or adds more redundancy to the network. So uh, ex uh, explicitly designed for this kind of environment and use, uh, usage. One of the case study or one of the examples that I can show here is um, um, a on-go plug and play LTE solution. Uh, a certain uh, security agency uh, uh, is trying to adopt our uh, LTE network so they can go in the middle of nowhere, get a mast up and with our e -node B and the EPC, they want to mount it within the vehicle and have a 10, 15 kilometers uh, ad hoc LTE network on the go. And uh, the size, the scalability, and durability of our product, it allows them to do it. So if I check all those six points that I had mentioned before, rugged, deployable, easy to use, you do not need LTE specialized people with Linux, space systems, and, and God knows what, simple IT professionals within one, with one week training can completely uh, control, maintain, and operate our EPC using simple web interface. As a matter of fact, Redline spent a lot of time and effort making that interface, web interface more user-friendly and uh, giving complete control. So talked about our EPC. <clears throat> so EPC, your LTE network is not going to be complete without e -Node B. So you can see here, the on the right hand side the the picture of our e node b it's a completely ruggedized e node b system which is single form factor unlike consumer grade lte systems which get uh, they have two uh two uh sub parts in uh, in an e node b so they have an rru which is installed on the tower and then they have a bbu which is like a rack which needs to be uh, in either it's outdoor with air conditioned uh, 
cabinets or it's supposed to be installed inside the air conditioned shelters and there are a lot of cablings going between these two so for the simplicity of this use for to make it industrial to make it more power uh, efficient to make it um, more reliable and rugged we have actually designed our enod in single form factor so complete bbu and rru are built in into this simple one box all you got to do is install this box this enod be on the top of the tower connect it to the antennas one cable comes down from this enod be connects to the router or the uh, or the network switch which then connects to the enod be uh, so which then connects to the epc so you just need one cable no messy cablings and uh, no rru bbus and complicated networks just one box connected to the antenna uh, in a real time environment i have actually clocked with our technical uh, uh, technician teams to install this enod b within a complete set of like 3 enod bs per tower in within 2 hours 2 hours 30 minutes time so one box it's uh, highly ruggedized it's been uh, designed to withhold withstand minus 40 to 75 degree temperature it's ip67 rated it has nickel plating powder coating so it can actually withstand the h2s and highly corrosive environments uh, it's a large it's a it's a large area enod b system so uh, it can provide you a large uh, area coverage but i have to make it clear here that when we are talking about lte the coverage of an lte network is not um is not defined by the e node b itself it is actually more dependent on the user equipment that you're holding in your hand because if you can see if you just look at it on downlink from the e node b towards you the signals are coming uh, uh, are pretty strong because there is an 11 db antenna let's say there is uh, a huge uh, you know 30 20 watt power being transmitted by the by the e node b so that's a pretty good uh, signal strong signal coming towards the uvs but the uvs on the other hand on our hands in our hands like uh, apple phones or android systems they have uh, would you call 0 2 or 3 db gain antenna limited tx power of 20 22 dbm so you're in certain cases when we talking about coverage the phone or the ue in our hand can actually receive the signals from the e node b but it does not have the capability and power enough to to send the signals back to the back to the e node b so it's specifically uh, uh, limited by the ues and red line has uh, uh, high gain ues uh, in hand too so peter sanders for offshore use is it able um, is it able to use yes so it is so it comes in zone 2 uh, environment uh, peter i have to get back to you with zone 1 as a matter of fact we have zone 1 solutions uh, for our virtual fiber technology so we have our in house zone 1 enclosures and i'm pretty sure i do not have i'm not saying it definitely but i'm pretty sure we have solution for zone 1 uh, or we can come up with it easily so if you have any inquiry or if you need to pursue that you can always reach out to me and uh, uh, i can um, i can connect you to the right people um, so we have zone 1 Uh, this e node b is it comes in zone 2 uh, uh, form factor but for zone 1 as you know that you need to have specific uh, enclosures which we have but i have to make sure that if uh, they are in the, uh, they it's meant for our e node b <clears throat> so uh, i believe uh, yeah so i will get back to you and connect you to the right person uh, so number 2 uh, uh again scalability so we are talking about now not connecting millions of people we're talking about connecting hundreds of thousands or uh, of uh, sensors in a, in a limit in a controlled environment so this e node b can support uh, number 1 covered large distance and number 2 it can support up to 128 active 
UEs. So I have seen people throwing out numbers, very big numbers, but 128 active UEs, it actually meets the most of the requirements. And we have to win in 50 in the roadmap, but what are the active UEs? So active UEs is that you can have, let's say 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 UEs connected in this area, in the area of this E node B. But at one instance, at one specific time, 120 UEs can talk. And mostly in IoT deployments, uh, when we talk about IoT, when the sensors are sending the, the messages, these messages are not continuous. These messages are the sensors, they send a message that periodically uh, sends a message to the server, server accepts it, if it needs to make, take any action against it, comes back. So they don't all continuously at one time keep on talking. So if there's even millisecond of the difference between two sensors talking, then you have only one, talk, uh, one sensor at one instance, which is active. So 128 UEs, I hope that I've done justice explaining this, but 128 UEs does not mean that it can only connect to 128. You can have 10,000 UEs in that area, but 128 at one specific moment can talk simultaneously. So our e -Node B has a complete Bolt TE, it's ready. And uh, as I've mentioned, it's a one box system, uh, extremely easy to install and low power consum uh, consuming system. Uh, if I could uh, show you, I want to save your time, but uh, we have seen that just a telescopic mask E not be on the top with an antenna and Vola in middle of nowhere and a vehicle based uh, APC and you have LTE network uh, up and running in 15 minutes time. So again, I, it checks all your six criteria to be considered industrial grade. We have, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, LTE network is mostly based on the, the coverage is dependent on the UE. Uh, so we have, we provide UEs, high antenna gain UEs through our ecosystems, and we're working on our own UEs too. And uh, we have a complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a partnership with Sonim phones, which are rugged, reliable, and we have push to talk flex core, uh, encrypted flex core application, which is, a, which is actually a complete dispatch control system. It can connect you with any P25 DMR, LMR, or, you know, Tetra network. So your smartphone can communicate with the P25 uh, network. It's completely encrypted 256 uh, AES encryption. Uh, the beauty of this is it also has uh, uh, the, the, the location tracking system. So in case of emergency, all the uh, staff members can be, uh, their location can be precisely uh, seen and where they are. And it's, a, it's an extremely good add in, uh, additive tool when it comes to mining and oil and gas uh, operations in case of emergency. Uh, you can create group calls, one-to-one -one, uh, communication. Uh, you can also uh, you know, uh, send uh, uh, data to each other directly like pictures or documents, etc. So uh, just talking about that, I, I think I've covered the main features of our technology and why it should be considered uh, an industrial gate network. And um, while doing that, I've also um, in, in, in a way showed you a complete scenario. How do we deploy an LT network in an offshore environment? So uh, uh, just, to, just to summarize, we have EPC, uh, which is distributed in this case. So one on land, one on one of the platforms, they are all backhauled to each other. And then we have simple single form factor E node Bs on the tower, which gives you a good, uh, uh, depending, you know, now it depends on your environment, the, the spectrum, the, the, the line of sights, uh, the UEs, the antenna gains, tower heights a lot, but you can actually take an average of 10 to 12 kilometers easily for this coverage around the tower. 
uh, if you have bigger uh, antennas for the UEs, you can we can always extend that coverage uh, coverage distance. So uh, <clears throat> saying that, just summarizing it again uh, and again. Uh, one thing that I want to mention here is that I mentioned I touched the point where. I talked about consumer grade LTE networks are revenue generating commodities. They're the revenue generating asset, but in industrial space in a private network, they are not, they're not revenue generating, they are enablers. So the CapEx involved in building your network is extremely important. It's, 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 it's very important to understand it. And most of the time I hear questions about considering or comparing the boxes to boxes, uh, radio to radio, EPC to EPC. But the, the main, the, but what, what's funny is that in a, in a private network, 60 to 70% of your new telecommunication system budget goes into building the telecom infrastructure. It goes into building new towers. It goes into building new shelters. It goes into building, uh, pro, uh, you know, establishing power uh, uh, solar systems or gen sets or the power infrastructure. And and if compared to that all investment, the the overall cost of the radio, now the overall cost of the of the product, it becomes insignificant. But keeping that in mind the product which can actually help you reduce this whole infrastructure cost is the product which will save a lot of capex involved in that network and building that network and redline product due to our long range the flexibility that we've built in our system the ruggedness we've built in our system we and and the way we've designed it to uh, our e node b has been designed to be powered by the solar systems so, so uh, considering these, considering the longest range, they're just like, I'm not talking about going very technical today here, but if you guys want, we can have another webinar we can, where we can go and dis, uh, discuss the bits and bytes of the whole technology and the value proposition. But just to give you a throw a number at you, a global, we, we have compared our LTE e node B's performance uh, in the market with the competition with a lot of consumer grade products and some which we're considering to be industrial grade. And just to throw a number and give you an idea, our e -Node B can do, uh, has a received sen signal sensitivity of minus 118 dBm. And as a matter of fact, we have not seen any vendor which even comes close to this number. The closest that comes to our receive signal capabilities, uh, sensitivities is, uh, is at least seven to eight dBm short of our uh, receive signal sensitivity. And what is receive signal sensitivity? Receive signal sensitivity is the ability of the product to, to receive a very weak signal and still understand it and maintain connectivity. So, the, the lowest the receive signal sensitivity of a product, the high, the longer the range, the longer the, the, the coverage area of that system is. So we, we are the industrial, uh, uh, what you call uh, the best product with receive signal sensitivity and many more. So if you guys want to more, more, we can obviously arrange more, uh, one more webinar talk about. So uh, we are not only in a business of selling boxes that we give our EPC, A node B, and then thank you so much, bye-bye. But no, we have complete uh, uh, suit of um, services where we have consultants, we provide consultancy for building industrial networks. Then we have our own RF, uh, RF engineers for RF planning. Uh, we have our network engineers for, for designing and configuring the core. We have uh, te telecommunication engineers, project managers. So from the, the ideas, from the inception of the idea of building an industrial LTE network and all the way to deploying it and going further to maintain it, Redline will be, uh, uh, can provide you services to, uh, to run that network. Uh, <clears throat> so 
uh, so uh, so we take responsibility of the end-to-end -end solution and also to uh, maintain it for you. Uh, so again, I'm going to leave you with one, uh, you know, thought of what is the difference? What is the requirement? Uh, people can talk about channel aggregations. They can talk about having, uh, you know, uh, 1 million users in the network, but do you need it or your requirement is totally different? Uh, channel aggregation, right now people I've seen across the globe, companies are in a constant struggle with their telecommunication regulation authorities to get Spectrum to run their own private LTE. In North America, they have started working on CBRS, but rest of the world, they're still struggling. They're context contesting the Spectrum with the MNOs that they're not providing us the, the frequency here. And so give us the license to operate in our field, uh, which is actually uh, going very well. A lot of companies have successfully uh, 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 received this, uh, the Spectrum and channels from their tele telecommunication uh, regulatory authorities. Um, so, and a lot more are trying. So I wanna say it's not impossible. It's yes, a bit difficult and complicated, but they're doing. Now, a company which gets 10 megahertz channel after fighting so much, and it meets their requirement, why do they care about channel aggregation? So there are certain marketing parameters, marketing numbers, but you got to see what do you need, what are your requirements, and what is the best fit. Uh, with that, I thank you for listening to me for almost one hour. Uh, and I hope that I added, I, I, I could deliver the value proposition or, or add uh, ants or, or talk about or touch the topics uh, or your pain points, or if you are a solution provider and you're working in industrial space, then give you some ideas that how to approach your clients.